thank you very much uh, also for this support. So uh, my name is Tristano Senati and uh, I am presenting uh, um, uh, this research about code of conducts. Uh, so all the other uh, participants of this research, uh, Nermi Armando Castro and Jackie Glass from UCL, uh, Giorgio Locatelli and Giacomo Dei from Politecnico and then myself from University of Leeds. And this research is about a uh, code of conduct to tackle uh, anti-corruption. So the, the problem we are trying to solve is uh, corruptions in infrastructure projects. So there is a, a very huge uh, body of literature of uh, how problematic is uh, this issue um, uh, for projects and for um, uh, the associated uh, economy and society. And uh, among the different uh, formal instruments that can be used to tackle uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this problem, uh, there is uh, the so-called code of conduct. That is uh, a formal instrument, is like a, 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 an organizational policy um, that is implemented. Uh, so, uh, and so this is the idea of code of conduct uh, to tackle um, a corruption. This research, uh, actually, uh, uh, to do it, uh, we um, assessed uh, these um, code of conduct in uh, 16 companies. Uh, the largest construction companies we identified at the outset uh, different rankings to uh, to really uh, consider the largest companies and they are mainly from us and uh, europe you can see the right hand um, on the right hand side the list of the companies we have considered and uh, uh, we assess on these uh, uh, code of conduct uh, um, we um, implemented a thematic analysis and uh, we started with uh, um, a protocol based on on some a few pilot uh, uh, um, uh, codes, and then uh, as soon as we um, um, clean up this and we reorganize properly, we applied uh, this uh, to all the remaining code of conducts. Uh, this was uh, really a, an inductive approach uh, when it comes to thematic analysis, and we applied the proper coding. Uh, on the different uh, codes. Most of the time, the organizations have uh, uh, either one or multiple uh, code of conduct. So because our research was on corruption, we uh, either uh, focus on the general code of conduct that sometimes enclose the, corru the corruption principles, or we consider... And uh, the, the thing I want to mention is that uh, uh, of, uh, among the different malpractice covered by the code of conduct, corruption is the ones uh, uh, overemphasized. And uh, sometimes companies uh, have uh, the general code of conduct plus the bespoke corruption code of conduct. And generally, uh, all of these companies analyzed uh, are multinationals. Uh, so they have uh, this code of conduct at group level. And uh, uh, we coded uh, uh, the different definitions and example, and uh, uh, as well as remedies. Uh, um, and you can see here the typical remedies identified by the code of conduct when it range from due diligence, vigilance, uh, vigilance and other precautions. And we also started with uh, a coding on different uh, uh, malpractices. So we, we cover also other uh, malpractices, but uh, what I'm going to present today is mainly about uh, 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 corruption. So I'm going to ask you to move next, please. And uh, I think this is probably the most uh, relevant um, uh, thing I would like to emphasize as part of this research. So um, many of the principle and definitions and, and examples were kind of common, uh, but uh, we um, I'm presenting now what uh, it seems to be the probably the most relevant message out of this research and uh, the more um, counterintuitive and controversial aspects of this research. So uh, firstly, that most anti-corruption principles are rather aspirational and not directly enforceable. And uh, so uh, uh, big sections in, in, uh, in this code of conduct uh, are aspirational in the sense that they just mentioned that uh, the group uh, and the organization is against corruption. And, uh, and uh, that alone is not uh, very useful to actually implement any, any specific procedure or principle that is directly legally enforceable. Uh, so uh, that is the first uh, comment. Um, uh, we kind of expected something like that, uh, but there are also some in, uh, enforceable elements. The second uh, point uh, is that uh, um, uh, auditing and reporting is mainly internal. Uh, 
And that gave us really the impressions that uh, uh, those companies mainly focus on their reputational damage rather than uh, uh, exposing in a way themselves uh, also to independent uh, uh, kind of uh, um, organizations to assess uh, or, or, um, or departments within the organizations to assess uh, the issue of uh, anti-corruption. And very often, and that is for us a little bit controversial, uh, the main uh, point uh, of uh, to report uh, issues uh, of uh, when it comes to corruption is the line manager. So you would expect the line manager uh, uh, and the employee that goes directly to the line manager, maybe to uh, you know discuss something like a bribe, and probably the line manager will be involved. So um, also this idea of maybe jump some of the management level is not fully implemented, and we we thought that was um, a problem. Thirdly, uh, whistleblower have uh, uh, their identity protected, so this is very important. However, uh, in some instances, we have uh, the feeling that there is not clearly how that is enforced, particularly in, the, in those situations when the employees report directly to their line manager. So uh, probably the line manager would distinguish them, so their identity wouldn't be protected. So fourth, in principle, most of uh, code of conduct pro prohibit any retaliation against whistleblowers. And uh, so this is a, <clears throat> another principle. Uh, some, some organizations express how, uh, and, uh, and they make sure that they, they have in, in place some of the processes to protect uh, their identity. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, this uh, fourth principle is much more credible. Other organizations uh, are not one, the ones that uh, report directly to the line manager, for example. And therefore, we are puzzled uh, how this is actually uh, implemented. And fifthly, um, uh, facilitation payment is sometimes tolerated. So this is uh, like a gray area uh, kind of connected to corruption uh, because uh, uh, there is an express uh, mentioning about uh, paying ransom in, and then uh, prioritizing, for instance, uh, the security of the employees uh, if they are kidnapped, for example, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that could be open the gates to potential types of uh, corruptions in a way. So that is kind of uh, controversial because some companies really mention that as a, as a, a way to uh, circumvent the typical uh, uh, barriers to uh, these uh, gray payments. Uh, other organizations, instead, uh, they are very strict uh, and against uh, 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 any type of facilitation payment. So this is a, an interesting, uh, perhaps controversial point. I'm, uh, I'm finishing with the eight minutes. I just want to mention in the end that, that this uh, kind of project in, uh, a, in, is funded by the PMI and uh, is uh, intending to inform the code of conducts at project level for, for, for projects. So we are trying to develop a proper a code of conduct standard for the, the construction industry in general. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention.